Good evening, my name is Julia Mastona Fevre, and I have the great honor and privilege to chair the Tyler Prize Executive Committee, which is responsible for the very difficult task of selecting each year one or more laureates. And this is why we're here today. And we're also responsible for looking after the entire Tyler Prize and, of course, the endowment that was received 46 years ago from John and Alice Tyler. So the, the prize was established in 1972, the same year that the first global conference on the environment was held. And this is the oldest prize in the environment, and many people refer to it, and I've heard this for many years before I became chair as the Nobel Prize for the Environment. So it it's really is, it certainly is one of the earliest prizes in the environment, and, and, and it is devoted to understanding and providing solutions to the challenges that face us, and unfortunately they're even more serious today, or at least we understand how serious they are than they were in 1972. So with tonight's celebrations, 76 brilliant individuals and four organizations have been recognized by the Tyler Prize. And if you look at the list in the little booklet uh, under your salads, you will see what a very distinguished group this has always been. So this evening's awards are particularly important at this time as we face the huge challenge of climate change caused by human beings, which with the kind of knowledge and abilities we have, we also have the ability to solve. And that's why we're here. So allow me to make a few introductions before we honor our laureates. So first of all, I'm going to ask my colleagues on the Tyler Prize Executive Committee, when I call on them to stand up, and you can give them a big applause afterwards. But this is a group of 10 people who really are devoted to all aspects of environmental achievement, which is what this award recognizes. And we all work together in a very collegiate and, 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 uh, and interesting manner. So first I'm going to ask Rosina Bierbaum. And if I would tell you all of the things that they do, it would take all night. So you will have to Google them. And then Maggie, and let's hold our applause. And then Maggie Catley Carson, where are you, Maggie? There, oh, there she is, I see you, good. And Alan Kovic, Alan is over there. Ezekiel Escura, Ezekiel. Owen Lind, where are you, Owen? I, 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 have, I can't see from here, but there you are, very good. Thank you, Judy McDowell, Judy is there, thank you, stay, stay. And Ken Nielsen. There you are. Okay, you see how we've spread out through this room. Jonathan Patz. Jonathan, you're right here. And Kelly Sims Gallagher. Kelly, there you are. Great. Wonderful. And of course, Amber Brown, who's the administrator of the prize. And there she is in that beautiful orange. Now we can clap. Without Amber, we couldn't do anything as you've all figured that out. And by the way, Amber, so many people have said to me that this is incredibly well organized. So I'm sure they'll say it at the end of this dinner too. <laughs> so we're also honored to have here with us the members of the Alice Tyler Perpetual Trust. And I'd like to ask them to also stand up, but I'll just tell you that this was founded in, 19, in 1993, and it's set up to help to advance global environmental causes and serve the needs of risk youth uh, around the world, issues of particular interest to Alice Tyler. So you can see that the Tylers were interested in these kinds of issues that are really close to our hearts. So we've got here the members of the, uh, of the, perpet the Tyler Perpetual Trust. So Paul Barber, where's Paul? Okay, great, and Alan Brown, and Anders Brown, Courtney Brown, John Hoag, and Nancy Sharp. So thank you all very much. And I know that some of you are related to Alice Tyler, and I hope that you 
can feel her spirit with us, even if she's no longer here, that the way I think we are satisfying the wishes of this couple who really had foresight in 1972, much before many people did. So we're also fortunate to have some of our former Tyler Prize laureates with us, and I'm really grateful for them to have come. So we've got Anne and, and uh, Paul Ehrlich. I know you're sitting over there. Please stand up so that people can. And here I think we can give them a hand. We've got Hans Herren. There, wonderful. Jim McCarthy, who got the prize last year. Jim. Perry McCarthy. Perry, where are you? There you are. Kirk Smith. And, and Diana Wall. Diana. So we also have a room full of incredibly important uh, guests here to celebrate our two laureates this evening. And if I would introduce each of them, we'd be here until tomorrow morning. So I think, we, but hopefully by the end of this evening, and we do have an opportunity to network afterwards, you'll get to know everybody. So the Tyler Prize is administered by the University of Southern California. And now I'd like to introduce Stephen Bradforth, who is Professor of Chemistry and Dean for Natural Sciences and Mathematics. So Stephen, over to you, please. Very many thanks, Julia. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to be here with you, with so many of the leaders in the vital effort to improve and sustain the natural environment. So on behalf of the institution I represent, the University of Southern California, I'd like to extend our congratulations to this year's Tyler Prize honorees. We've, we've recognized some of the outstanding leaders on the Tyler Executive Committee, but I'd particularly like to thank Julia Martin Lefebvre for all the work she does. And, and my own personal shout out to Amber Brown. Uh, she, I know how hard she works on this all year. So USC is really proud to have served uh, for 38 years as the administrative partner for uh, the Tyler Prize. Um, we had a meeting today, the executive committee, and we found new ways uh, to enhance the partnership uh, between the university and the Tyler Prize. Um, we want to promote the environmental achievements today uh, by today's thought leaders uh, with a positive message that we can take to the next generation uh, that we see on our university campuses of what the human race can do to better, be better stewards of the planet. Rather soberingly, in the years since our last Tyler Prize ceremony in Washington, D.C., and as pointed out yesterday, we received a rather terrifying report from the IPCC this year. This report urged humanity to make unprecedented changes if we are to avert a climate change catastrophe. So I'm pleased we're here in California recognizing a Tyler Prize for those who've helped galvanize both the scientific establishment and the world to what is happening with our, cli our climate on the planet. Interestingly, we're now st finally starting to break through in what is ironically one of the very most difficult barriers to action, a having a frank and productive conversation. In the United States, we're having to do this in face of disruptive political environment, but we're following an old cliche. Think globally, act locally. So places like San Francisco, even car culture Los Angeles, and cities around the world are responding to the very best ideas rather than the loudest voices, and are leading by setting really far-reaching agendas. Um, in the state, both Northern and Southern California are the front line for discovery and entrepreneurial endeavors in the fast-growing green economy. As Michael Mann has encouraged us to think, the message really can be positive. A call to transform our ways also brings great opportunity. So here, as a, as a university professor, 
I realize that universities have a tremendous responsibility to drive both the conversation and innovation related to climate change. I don't think any university in the world can be a global leader today if it isn't leading the way forward on sustainability in the environment. So at USC, we're starting to tap the full range of experts and leaders across the university, engaging with public leaders in the private sector and in government, and we're realizing we need to bring every single person to the table, policymakers and economists, even psychologists and storytellers, entrepreneurs and philanthropic leaders. Um, one thing that was wonderful on my campus a few weeks ago was the college held our first Climate Forward Conference. We brought former Secretary of State John Kerry to campus who gave a keynote, and the event brought together scholars, private sector leaders, politicians from both sides of the aisle, from the UN, and from overseas leaders and policymakers to work through the ways of overcoming political roadblocks that prevent environmental solutions from being implemented. It's been really exciting for me to see the number of students at USC at this event and to see how they've been coalescing around a growing sustainability focus. I'll give you one example. I, I met one of our undergraduates recently, Andrea Morrow, who of her own volition did something that we at the university should have done a long time ago. When she was exploring universities to attend, she couldn't find an institution that made it really simple to see all the things that were going on at that institution on sustainability and find out how majors could get involved in the effort. So she took it upon herself and she built a beautiful website highlighting everything that was going on at our own institution and trying to put forward to the students what they could do to engage with all the faculty doing work in this area. It was actually mind boggling to see how much we were really doing, but it was that example that was really sobering for me. These students expect to have an impact, not just when they graduate, but also after they pursue their degrees. They really get it. Climate change is an existential problem for them, dumped on their generation. It hasn't stopped them embracing the challenge. They really want to know how they can take this on. So I think we recognize that exact same gumption in our honorees today, Warren Washington and Michael Mann. They exemplify the virtue of dedicating oneself to something of extrinsic, sorry, of intrinsic value. And finally, there's a really exciting opportunity here as educators and researchers. Uh, science, uh, we've seen, has been part of revealing the problem, but is also part of the solution. There's one misconception I often hear on university campuses, which is we have all the science and technology to solve the problem of climate change. It's just a matter of political will. I don't agree with that statement. I think it's that scientists are there to provide disruptive new ideas. Think if scientists could make energy from solar so cheap, an order of magnitude cheaper than fossil fuels, that there wouldn't even be an economic argument anymore. We would simply not agree to pay for fossil fuels. So I think that there is tremendous excitement and actually some of the science that we need to discover is right at the cutting edge of basic research. So I think that this is a very invigorating time and it's really important to get our students engaged in that solution. So, from my colleagues and from the students at USC, congratulations, Dr. Washington and Dr. Mann, for your most outstanding accomplishments. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and it really is an honor and a privilege to be partnering with the University of Southern California. I'm not going to make a speech, but I do want to say that look out on Monday or Tuesday, you will see another, another frightening assessment coming out from the panel that was set up much later than IPCC, which is looking at, at biodiversity and ecosystem services. And there will be an assessment, I'm, I'm involved in that that will tell us that we're not doing well on the biodiversity side either. And of course, these two issues do belong together. But let's come back to tonight. So as you know, tonight we are here to celebrate the 2019 Tyler Prize laureates, Dr. Michael E. Mann and Dr. Warren M. Washington.
You can see why we're beaming this evening. This is really, you're right, Shirley, this was, this was a great award again. Every year we manage, and this is great. And I think what's really important is, of course, the science, as Stephen said, has to go on. And both of these Tyler Prize laureates are doing the science, but they're also bothering to go to the next step, even to, even to live dangerously. Uh, by telling people and trying to encourage change, and that's what we really need. Now I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, one of my colleagues on the Tyler Prize Executive Committee, Professor Jonathan Patz, who's professor and the John P. Holton Chair of Health and the Environment and the Director of the Global Health Institute at the University of Wisconsin. So, Jonathan, please come up. You were very good in that video. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Uh, good, good evening. So it's an honor to serve on the Tyler Executive Prize and be on the Executive Committee to select the laureates. Tonight, I'm especially delighted to introduce distinguished professor Michael Mann. But first, I want to quote from you, uh, I want to quote from a letter to the editor regarding a 1996 paper on climate change. And I quote, this strange emphasis on phantom global, the strange emphasis on a phantom global problem at the expense of real local and national problems strikes many as both unscientific and irresponsible, wrote the infamous climate denier, Dr. Fred Singer, <laughs> attacking, attacking me on, for my first paper on climate change published in the Journal of the American Medical Association just a few months before Dr. Mann completed his PhD from Yale University. So Michael Mann and I share some experiences with climate skeptics. <laughs> we also served together on the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. However, while my own work sparked just a few darts thrown my way, Dr. Mann fought and triumphed over an, a massive industry-backed, full-out campaign. The reason was simple. His groundbreaking proxy reconstructions of historical climate over centuries and even millennia, using tree rings, ice cores, and lake sediments, finally shed light on just how serious and abrupt is the recent heating of our planet. In fact, so striking is the rapid rise of Earth's temperatures that a graph of the data resembles the shape of a hockey stick turned on its side. That definitely woke up the world and galvanized the climate science community, but it also triggered a concerted disinformation war on the hockey stick and on its leading scientists. The campaign included illegal hacking of emails of several climatologists and other unscrupulous, unscrupulous acts. The assault paralleled that of the tobacco wars and even surpassed the intensity and personal attacks, including an envelope mailed to Dr. Mann containing white powder, I kid you not. Professor Mann suffered battle scars for stepping forward to speak truth to power. But with a global climate crisis upon us, with barely more than a decade now left to cut fossil fuel emissions by half in order to stabilize our climate, Michael Mann's integrity, bravery, and optimism serve as a model and inspiration for all scientists. By the way, I had dinner with his family on Wednesday night, and his daughter, Megan, informed me that her dad is a serious collector of Marvel superhero comics. <laughs> that, that explains a lot. <laughs> and yes, they did see Avengers Endgame this past Saturday, the opening weekend. 
Michael Mann's invaluable scientific contributions, coupled with his commitment to clear communications to truly make a difference, are recognized around the globe. In 2014, he received the Friend of the Planet Award from the National Center for Science Education. In 2017, he was awarded the Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Science Communication, and last year, the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, gave him their Public Engagement with Science Award. And so, it is only fitting that this year, Dr. Michael Mann has now won the Nobel for Environmental Achievement, the Tyler Prize. So, So, Michael, why don't you come up here, and I'm going to read. I get to give you this beautiful medal, which if you'll allow me, I'm going to put around Please. your neck. So... I'm going to read the citation here, and, and actually I'm going to hand that to the, the check. <laughs> so the 2019 Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement presented to Michael E. Mann in recognition for investigating climate variability in past centuries using proxy data to synthesize patterns and past climate trends and informing public discourse on the effects of climate change. Thanks so much uh, for those very kind words. I want to thank uh, the Tyler uh, Foundation, the Executive Committee, uh, for recognizing me, and, and particularly um, being able to share this award with a, a true hero of mine, uh, Warren Washington, is especially meaningful to me. Um, you know, uh, this is not the life that I uh, had, had set out to, to lead. Um, I was a math and physics nerd. Uh, uh, in, in high school, I went off to UC Berkeley to double major in applied math and physics, uh, then went off to Yale University to study theoretical physics, and really all I wanted was to be left alone in a room with computers, crunching numbers, uh, trying to solve uh, interesting problems. Well, uh, ultimately, my interest led me into this burgeoning field of climate science, uh, in, including uh, some of the same sort of climate modeling that, of course, uh, uh, Warren Washington had uh, sort of helped uh, establish. Um, uh, and so I was working with climate models and observations uh, and uh, was making forays into uh, using so-called proxy data, like tree rings and corals and ice cores, uh, because I was interested in the long-term natural variability of the climate system, interested in whether there were long-term climate cycles. Uh, climate change wasn't really on my radar screen. But uh, our forays into using these data ultimately led to the publication of this curve that has now come to be known as the hockey stick. And uh, it had profound implications um, for the problem of human-caused climate change because uh, it told us in uh, you know, uh, very convincing terms that there was something unprecedented about the warming that we were seeing today. And by implication, it, it probably had something to do with us. So when we published this uh, curve back on Earth Day, uh, April 22nd, 1998, now more than two decades ago, uh, whether I realized it or not at the time, the publication of the hockey stick curve uh, put me on a fundamentally different path from the, the path that I uh, thought um, that I would uh, follow, um, and uh, what it meant was whether I liked it or not, um, I was going to have to defend uh, 
myself and, and my science against attacks that weren't entirely scientific in nature. And I had to learn uh, the new rules of engagement um, when it comes to the very fractious uh, public debate over climate change and what to do about it. Uh, I had to learn a whole new set of uh, tools and, and rules. Um, and it, it led me, again, on a very different path from the one that I had set out uh, you know, on, uh, I would have been perfectly happy if they had just let me alone. <laughs> um, uh, you know, crunching numbers and doing calculations, that's uh, fundamentally what I love doing. But because they wouldn't leave me alone and because they, uh, you know, the, the, the larger, um, you know, interests, uh, fossil fuel interests, uh, vested interests looking to discredit our science, um, forced me uh, into the public sphere, whether I liked it or not. And uh, ultimately, as you've all gathered by now, I have come to embrace that role. Um, <laughs> although it's not the one that I signed up for, uh, it's hard to imagine you know, uh, a more important cause uh, that you know, one could devote oneself to than trying to inform the public discourse over what is arguably the greatest challenge that we face as a civilization, um, the, the challenge to live sustainably on this planet and uh, specifically to avert catastrophic climate change. Now, um, as uh, folks have already mentioned, uh, there is you know, great urgency right now. Um, we are at a, a pivotal point in history if we do not dramatically transition away from our reliance on fossil fuels um, to renewable energy, if we do not bring our global carbon emissions down by you know, five to 10% a year for the next uh, decade and beyond, then we will commit to what can reasonably be described as catastrophic warming of the planet and catastrophic climate change. Um, so there's great urgency, and this is my mantra these days, there is great urgency, but there is also agency. Um, we, we can solve this problem. We do have within our means um, the, the solution to this problem. And one of the things that gives me optimism, and my daughter, my 13-year-old daughter is here, and she uh, every day uh, reminds me, and by the way, my family, I want to thank my, my family, my wife, uh, Lorraine. <laughs> and my daughter, Megan, um, for the, the support uh, that they have provided over the years. Um, and every day they remind me that um, that's what this is about. What sort of world do we want to leave behind for our children and grandchildren? Uh, we still have an opportunity to make sure that we do not leave behind a degraded planet uh, for future generations. And one of the things that, that gives me inspiration is the young folks, is you know, the Greta Thunbergs and the Alexandria Vilsenors and all the children across the planet who are now literally marching in the streets and striking against uh, school uh, uh, Fridays for the future um, and forcing the hand of, of adults and politicians um, and uh, making very clear that if we do not act now, we are going to essentially destroy th this planet for, for them and, and future generations. And the, uh, the, the moral authority with which these um, kids speak, it, it's really changed the conversation. Um, just uh, yesterday you may have read uh, the, U the, the, the parliament, the UK parliament um, has voted to declare a climate emergency. Um, this is one of the more conservative, uh, you know, uh, bodies um, in politics today, and I believe that they um, that that is going to start a um, a, a global um, movement now, where you know there will be a recognition that we have to act and we have to act now, and we have to uh, incentivize policies that take us away from the burning of fossil fuels. And yes, we have to battle entrenched and very powerful vested interests in, in doing so. But you know, the, the fact that um, you know that our children, it's gotten to the point where our children are the ones who've had to speak out and they've had to literally march in the streets. Um, that it's gotten to that point uh, gives me hope that maybe we are seeing 
that tipping point, and not the tipping points we fear, the, the climate tipping points, the, the, the destruction of the ice sheets, massive sea level rise, the release of methane. There are climate tipping points that we fear we may be nearing, but there's a societal tipping point that's taking place today that I think will save it. Um, and so I think we're going through that movement right now. It's part of why I, I do have optimism that despite the challenges we face, um, with, with an administration that literally denies climate change and has, um, you know, uh, uh, essentially nominated to cabinet level positions, uh, fossil fuel lobbyists and climate change uh, deniers who have tried to, uh, to dismantle the environmental protections put in place over a half a century. Despite those challenges, um, there's something else happening today. Um, and uh, it gives me hope that, um, that we are going to turn the corner just in time to avert uh, climate catastrophe. So I wanna thank everybody uh, again for this recognition. It, it's wonderful to be part of the legacy um, of, the, of the Tyler Prize and to be in, in this room with uh, some of my real heroes um, and to join them in, in sharing in this legacy. So thank you very much. Thank you, that was beautiful, and thank you for reminding us that there is hope, and there is time, but there's urgency. You're absolutely right. And it's great to have Megan with us. We have really tried, we do have quite a few young people, I think you're the youngest, uh, but, uh, but we do have quite a few people who are marching on whenever they can, and there is hope, but we've got to move fast. So now I have the pleasure of introducing another brilliant member of the Tyler Prize Executive Committee, Professor Rosina Bierbaum, who has two hats right now, many hats. I'm just going to mention two. She is professor at the School for Environmental, Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan, and also the Roy F. Weston Chair in Natural Economics at the University of Maryland. I don't know how you do that, but you do many, many other things. Rosina, please come and join me. Thank you, Julia. Good evening, everyone. I, you know, there have been a lot of fabulous articles written about tonight's dynamic duo, but it was Bud Ward who said, they're kind of yin and yang. And I suspect Dr. Washington is quite comfortable in his black tie today, as we always see him in a bow tie and suit. Michael? Rarely. Warren is known for being reserved, quiet, soft-spoken, and even sort of flying under the proverbial radar. Michael, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Warren is one of the estimable elder statesmen of the climate science community. And Mike, you could be Warren's son, and in a way you are his intellectual son. But together, these two are a cross-generational superhero force for good for science in the service of society. <laughs> so it is my great honor to award the Tyler Prize to Warren M. Washington. He is often referred to as the father of climate modeling and would immediately tell us, but it was working with co-developer Akira Kasahara. And as you told us, Dr. Washington, you persisted in physics, despite being advised that you would be smart to avoid that really tough field and instead go into another curriculum. You persisted, and we are so glad you did. Dr. Washington joined the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR, almost immediately after finishing your doctorate at Penn State, and then began, began the odyssey he developed groundbreaking atmospheric computer models using fundamental laws of physics to predict future states of the atmosphere and to explore climate change. And then as his research developed over decades, 
Dr. Washington worked to incorporate the oceans and sea ice, and now today we can incorporate hydrology and even vegetation. And so these models have been used extensively in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which won the Nobel Prize, shared by Warren, his fellow scientists at NCAR, and many people in this room, as well as around the world. But Dr. Washington's impact is not just his pioneering work to develop these models, but also being a civic scientist and sharing the findings in the policy arena. And as you heard, he served as advisor to six presidents, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, and Obama. And Governor Sununu, who was then the chief of staff to Father Bush, asked Dr. Washington to make a simplified version of the NCAR model so that he could play with it while the president was also thinking about the upcoming Rio meeting. And I would remind you it was George H. W. Bush who subsequently signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And Dr. Washington taking science into the policy world and speaking truth to power had real impact then as it also did for President Obama in the lead up to the signing of the amazing Paris Climate Agreement. And President Obama awarded Warren Washington the National Medal of Science in 2010 for two things. One, your groundbreaking models, and two, your groundbreaking mentorship. Because science is only part of the raison d'etre of this man. Warren Washington was the second African American to earn a doctorate in atmospheric chemistry and the first to serve as the president of the American Meteorological Society. And through your leadership, Dr. Washington, there are now hundreds of members from underrepresented groups in the AMS. And you appropriately point proudly to the color of weather sessions that happen every year as part of the AMS meetings. Your sage advice to us is, quote, it is more healthy for society when we have a good representation of everybody who comes from different backgrounds and cultures participating. Warren has mentored literally legions of diverse students who carry his legacy and his reach is everywhere. I had the honor of calling Warren and Mary after the Tyler Committee unanimously decided to award him the 2019 Tyler Prize. And I remember saying, Dr. Washington, I know the day that President Obama hung the Medal of Science around your neck brought all of us to our feet and to tears of joy but it is our great honor to hang another gold medal around your neck. And again, you do bring us to our feet and bring us tears of joy and gratitude. So I would invite you to join us now on this stage so we can award you the prize. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to give this to you first. She's going to put the medal on. So you. first, for you to become a, really a Tyler Prize laureate, you have to wear this another gold medal around your neck. <laughs> and it looks and wonderful. And let me just read Thank this. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. In recognition for pioneering the development and wide use of global climate models to understand the role of human activities and natural processes contributing to global climate change, mentoring generations of atmospheric scientists, and championing a diverse and inclusive science and engineering workforce, you get the 2019 Tyler Prize. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both for, for those very kind words. Oh, I forgot to give you the check. Let me give you the check. Give us a check, and then you would like us to take pictures of us. And there is a check. It's not about the money. 
Thank you for those very kind and, and meaningful comments about me. I, <clears throat> I feel still uh, overly modest about the fact that I worked with many good people over the years and got good guidance in working with you know, former mentors and so forth. I want to say a few things first about having uh, worked on some of the earliest climate models. Our, our purpose was to actually come up with a new tool. It, it wasn't necessarily to solve any particular problem, but after uh, some successful years in the 1960s and 1970s, where the models were still crude, but capable of doing experiments with, we were able to use our model to examine the question of what happens if the concentration of carbon dioxide increases. And we gave some of the earliest uh, simulations. In fact, one of them was a simulation that we did in, you know, I think, 1989. It was picked up by uh, Newsweek magazine. <clears throat> and then it was there, there were, were comments to the article about from John Sununu, who was George Bush's chief of staff. And um, I sent a telegram that he didn't understand properly <laughs> on what we did. <clears throat> sent a telegram to him. And I arrived at home, and there was a telephone ringing, and it was John Sununu. And he said, what do you mean I'm wrong? <laughs> <clears throat> Are you solving those equations by finite differences, spectral, or finite element methods? Well, I knew this wasn't the ordinary <laughs> policy question. <laughs> <clears throat> Turned out that he got his PhD in fluid dynamics. <laughs> anyway, we had an interesting exchange of telephone calls uh, because he wanted me to do because I said, well, you can read all about this in my first edition of my book. <laughs> and so I said, we'll send it to you overnight mail. <laughs> He called on the next evening and said, it didn't get here. <laughs> Somebody's in trouble. I imagine somebody in the mail room at the White House was sitting on it. But anyway, uh, uh, a few weeks later, Alan Bromley, the science advisor for George Bush, wanted me to come and speak to the cabinet with a NOAA colleague. <clears throat> and also come spend some time with John Snowden in his office. But he wouldn't tell me what it was about. It turned out that it was about putting a climate model in the White House, which I thought was a little strange because I told him, whatever you want, we'll run some calculations for you. Oh, no, he wants to do it himself. And so we figured out a little model that he could use. Well, yeah, things didn't change much over the years, but I wanted to say, say that, that we made more progress later when we added to our models more realistic features like vegetation and we're actually at the point where we're putting in glaciers in our models. So <clears throat> the climate models are really a, a tool that is freely available. Just anybody can sort of download it and put it on a computer system. And, and several countries have done that. Uh, <clears throat> but I should point out with, with Michael, getting a, a sort of a unfriendly uh, situation with oil companies and the gas companies and so forth. 
I've had some similar experiences, Michael. I don't think I ever told you this. I got my my latest call was from somebody uh, from Seattle, saying that uh, he. He's going to try me in the Nuremberg trials. <laughs> and he said, Nuremberg, Pennsylvania. I didn't know that there, is there a Nuremberg, Pennsylvania? I looked it up, and there is a Nuremberg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, he made some threatening uh, claims about my well-being and being able to live longer. I, I turned it over to NCAR's contracts people, but also I, turn, I, I turned it over to the FBI. The FBI knew about this guy, and uh, he was uh, uh, kept an eye on. So. Anyway, I've had other calls at other times where we gave a talk at the University of Oklahoma, and as I was walking to, to the auditorium with the, the, the dean of the college, he said, don't worry, Warren, I've got the police here for you. <laughs> it turned out that at the end of my talk, he jumped up and started screaming and hollering that I was ruining the world. <clears throat> and the police came and took him out. <laughs> so I know a little bit about, uh, Michael, the sort of situations that you encounter. Well, I just want to mention a few other things, and, and, and the other is that I've had a complex life. Um, I started out as a bit of an activist in high school where uh, I was the uh, a representative of, or the vice chairman of the Youth Council of the NAACP, and we were uh, campaigning throughout the, the, the city of Portland, Oregon, to get a public accommodations law because there were a lot of places and hotels and restaurants which would not serve African Americans. And in 1952, we finally got it passed by, uh, uh, so that that sort of thing has, you know, stopped being a problem for minority groups. So I think Shirley Malcolm, who I think had something to do with me being up here at this stage, knows that I've been very active in, in the political scenes of of dealing with civil rights issues all the way from high, when I was in college. I asked the president of Oregon State University, why in a school like this do you have segregation in the sororities and fraternities? And he said, oh, it's an amoral issue. We shouldn't worry about it. I looked up the definition of amoral, and it wasn't what I considered the, the right definition. But anyway, the, uh, I've, I, under the Clinton administration, I became the, a member of the National Science Board. Then I was chair of the board for four years, and we were able to get increased budgets for the National Science Foundation and many of the other agencies that depend upon the National Science Board to give advice to the President and Congress. Although I have to admit, I had to testify to Congress twice a year, and I was, I got a little tired of getting beat up along with the NSF director. <laughs> because of many of the congressmen and senators had their own view about what the foundation should be doing. Uh, I think that we have actually made a lot of progress, and I have to point out just one thing to end up with, is there is, there is hope that we can do something about climate change. And, and Tony, 
Busilaki, the, the, the head of, of, the, of UCAR, who is sitting down here, and I uh, helped shepherd a report uh, through the academy structure, which had to do with technologies that will uh, decrease the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And that was a challenge because th there is a lot of bright and capable scientists and engineers and others in the area of technology that have come up with ideas for dealing with climate change. I hope that this will uh, allow for multiple approaches to dealing with climate change and, and technologies and to help solve this problem. We have, of course, a good foundation with solar energy and wind energy, but there are other solutions that can be used that will really help solve this problem and we need to apply most of them. I talked about a few of those yesterday. Well, again, thank you very much for, for giving me this, this, this award, but it reminds me of the fact that we still have a lot of things to do to solve the problem of climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Washington. You've inspired us on so many levels. And indeed, there is hope, but we're gonna work fast and even better. So this is the last time you're going to see me here, and then we're going to have dinner. <laughs> so, but first of all, I want to say that, again, warmest congratulations to our laureates. And I want to say that we've received hundreds of messages. And if I were to read them all, we would be here for weeks. I, wa I want to just read one and let you listen to one. So this one just came yesterday from John Holdren, who many of you know, who is a Tyler Prize laureate, and he was very sorry not to be with us. He was President Obama's science advisor. And I'll just read you a little bit of his long letter to both of you, dear Mike and Warren. Both of you are immensely deserving of this recognition, and I could not be happier with the Tyler jury's decision to award it to both of you this year. I join my several friends among the previous winners who are able to celebrate with you in San Francisco in offering my heartiest congratulations and many thanks for your enormous contributions to scientific and public understanding of the climate change challenge. I'm not going to read the hundreds of other letters, but you both have them, so you're gonna be up for many nights reading them. My last thing that I want to say is that I am, I've inherited a very lovely Tyler Prize award ceremony um, ritual, uh, and that is that I want to describe what you've got in the center of the table. So these are flesh, fresh flowers that are, first of all, the containers are made of recycled glass, and the flowers include local seasonal uh, blooms from less than 40 miles from San Francisco, so they're local. And the containers are recyclable and reusable, and the arrangements are fully compostable. And so the tradition is that you discuss among yourselves, but the person whose birthday is the closest to Earth Day, which is 22 April, gets to take this amazing <laughs> flower arrangement home. So you see, we walk the talk, even of what we do. And finally, I want... And this is my, you can negotiate among yourselves, but it should be to the person whose birthday is closest to Earth Day. So finally, I want to say, I want to wish you bon appetit and to tell you that we will be serving such, such lack, of, lack of discipline here. We will be serving dessert outside, so we'll be able to, you'll be able to talk to our laureates and to each other. Bon appetit and thank you. Thank you.